tuned because you're going to love Dallas Music Network's brand new podcast series, The Deep Dive. In The Deep Dive, you'll get a raw look at entertainment's inner world from the people who know showbiz best. Your fearless leaders on this fantastic voyage are Grammy-winning producer and engineer Paul Pappy Middleton and seasoned producer and talent developer Matt Trax. Collectively, they've worked with the likes of Erica Badu, Bonnie Raitt, Willie Nelson, Lyle Lovett, Bobby Sparks, and many, many more. Get ready, because it's about to get deep. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Pappy. Uh, I'll keep it as simple as I can be. Uh, today, tonight, we're doing something that has been very dear to me all of my life, and a dear friend of mine who just happened to be in the middle of what this vision and dream was for me, just happened to live up on the corner and I've known him for a bunch of years. I just didn't know he was doing what I was looking for and hadn't been looking yet. You know, it was just there. And he is the leader and the, uh, the maker of a band called the Rock Ridge Big Band. And Again, to fulfill a vision that I had, I grew up uh, with my dad loving music of the 1930s, and it was all the big band sounds. So as I was four years old and five and six years old, this is what I was hearing, and this is what my dad loved. And so for me as a recording engineer and a studio owner and a musician, singer-songwriter, and all that kind of stuff all my life, I have looked forward to being able to, well, it's the reason I built this studio this way was to be able to do what we're doing right now. And this is Mr. Larry Spencer of the Rock Ridge Big Band. Why did you put this band together? And, and you know, because I know what the, the name stands for. Let everybody else know. Well, I've played in big bands my entire life. And uh, even going back as far as um, high school, they didn't have a big band. And back then we called them stage bands, or that's what they were called. And I had heard about them. And after listening to Doc Severinsen on the TV, I just thought we ought to have a stage band in our high school. And so the band director agreed to, uh, to start one. And I had played with Buddy Rich and Woody Herman big bands. I was in the one o'clock band. Um, I played in big bands uh, behind uh, people like Frank Sinatra, Mel Torme, Tony Bennett, um, many, many, many other big names. Uh, really fortunate to have uh, played professionally uh, with, with these folks. And so I've played in big bands my whole life and have almost always played in um, bands that uh, now are typically called rehearsal bands, which means you go play in a nightclub or a bar and uh, you don't get har paid hardly any money. But you get to play the music you want to play and everybody gets together for fun. Um, all that to say is I was always in the trumpet section. And earlier this year, uh, I was playing in a rehearsal band and the leader got really sick and he wasn't going to be able to lead the band anymore. And so those of us that were experienced uh, decided to get together and keep the band going. And I was uh, tasked with being the music director. And so I got out in front of the band and ran the rehearsals and then led the band for, at the shows. And I guess at this point in my career, I realized I kind of liked really being out front um, and being able to choose the music and hear all my fantastic friends play. Um, and I really 
got more joy out of standing out in front than I thought I would. So when the band leader recovered from his surgeries, he wanted to take the leadership of his band back. Um, and I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to lead my own band because I'm actually having fun doing this. And a bit of a sense of humor and a bit of trivia. Uh, there's a scene in Mel Brooks' movie, Blazing Saddles, early on, where out in the middle of the desert, they come across Count Basie and his big band playing. <laughs> and then, lo and behold, the entire town of Rock Ridge is uh, the basis of the movie. And so I decided to name it the Rock Ridge Big Band. This all kind of started again for me, uh, a very dear friend of ours out here that was a neighbor and a, you know, a great player, sax player, had passed away. And they did a huge memorial for him down in Deep Ellum that me and, and so many of my friends showed up for. Uh, it was, you know, how many were there? How many? It, was, it looked like there were 30 people in the band. I mean, it was a 20 piece big band. You know, horns all the way across the stage and up on the stage and the drummer and all the rest of the guys were up behind there, but I would just sit there in awe. And so I went back here to the studio and just started getting into my mind about all this stuff that it, you know, had haunted me since my early days. And so I called him and I went to one of their uh, rehearsal gigs and it was great. I was, you know, I was, you know the audience. And uh, it just blew me away, just blew me away. They were up there just having fun playing tunes, you know, and going through them. And the people were, you know, what was it, a Tuesday night? Something that like was a Tuesday night. Tuesday night, like 7 o'clock. So the crowd had, you know, was just starting, the people were just starting to come in. And uh, it was a place that was a restaurant type bar, so they would eat and, and drink and everything. But it was just so much fun for me to hear this and think about my past history that uh, I just couldn't help it, but just, you know, as soon as I, you know, the next day we started talking about all this and, and putting it together. And this all came together in like 48 hours. You know, they had already had a certain time that they were planning on getting together again. And I had to try to build it around of getting this all together to doing it. And so it was like, I can't remember who said it, it was like herding cats <laughs> to, to put together a 20 piece band. <laughs> and I said, well, I can dig that because I had a three piece band and it was like herding a cat. Yeah, come on, come on, come on, let's go this way. One of the things when, you know, when you get to be an aged person <laughs> is looking back on all the stuff that you've done. And when you know somebody who has done these things like Larry has within playing in the bands that he's played and uh, he can fill you in because it is just a uh, might as well have a scroll here just to keep scrolling through all the people he's played with and like all of us musicians engineers and people in the music industry as you work with you know with any one of your heroes it is it's that's the reason for me that's one of the reasons I do what I do because I'm a musician that went into engineering because I have as much fun engineering as I did playing because it's still all a part of that magical moment. And that's the reason the studio was built that way and that's why people like Larry uh, are, are so valued in this industry because they do it for the love of it. It's the feeling you get from doing this that makes us stay in it. Over 12,000 uh, gigs that I've uh, done over the years um, there's those magical moments that are uh, uh, etched in my memory and uh, there's there's too many of them fortunately for for me to actually go through all of them or even remember all of them so uh, a few of those uh, that's that strike me in in my memory is 
playing with um, the originator of the moonwalk, which was not Michael Jackson. It was Cab Calloway. <laughs> and I got to play behind uh, Cab Calloway uh, a number of times. And it was just such a blast. He was so full of energy and um, just amazing. And of course, the trumpet parts had the names of the players in his band. And so I was playing first trumpet. So the, the person's name, it didn't say first trumpet. It said Dizzy, <laughs> which was Dizzy Gillespie. And so it was actually the original manuscript. That is such a great memory. Okay, so getting to do a tour with Frank Sinatra was like uh, being, uh, for me, like being a rock star. Um, we were treated first class always. And uh, it was, you know, world-class musicians, world-class accommodations. And of course, there's the chairman of the board himself up in front of the band. It was just fantastic. But one little memory really, really sticks in. We were at an opera house. And of course, it's sold out. And it's a, it's a beautiful acoustics. It's a 35-piece orchestra with a big band and strings. And, you know, beautiful wooden floors. Unbelievable acoustics. And um, every night on this tour, Frank would sing uh, Willow Weep for Me. And he didn't drink anymore by this point, but there was always a fresh bottle unopened of Jack Daniels <laughs> backstage, and they would pour two fingers and put it on the piano. And he didn't smoke anymore, but there was always a fresh pack of Marlboro Reds <laughs> on the, the piano, on the Steinway Grand Piano. <laughs> and the spotlight would come down, the whole stage is dark, and he'd take a sip out of the glass of Jack Daniels, and he'd take a puff of the unfiltered cigarette and start singing. And it's just like, like, just one of those magical moments. And it was just beautiful. It was just, it was just fantastic. And then he'd just stamp out the cigarette on stage. And I guess the only person could ever do that would be Frank Sinatra. Oh my God. <laughs> um, one of the other magical moments uh, was playing at the American Airlines Center for Don Henley's 70th birthday. If you can imagine with the Eagles and Stevie Nicks and his band, um, that was just a, a fantastic uh, moment and a really, really fun. So there was one song, we had not rehearsed it. And on my part, it said, hold out. I end up on a high F sharp. And it said, hold out until drum cue. And everybody else stopped except me because the drummer didn't cue it. <laughs> and so I held it, and I held it, and I held it, and I held it <laughs> until the drummer threw his sticks up in the air and just said, okay. <laughs> and I'm like, going, I don't know, I'm just following my directions here. There wasn't really any rehearsal on this one, but um, the crowd went wild and they loved me.
(laughs) (laughs) Well, but that's one of those, uh, yeah, yeah, nerves of steel. I'm holding on to it. You better cue me. You got to keep, you got to cue me. I'm reading my part. Okay. What I can tell the viewing audience, (laughs) there is a note on one of the songs that we've done that I still don't know how he did it because it's a note that just is like somebody playing a synthesizer with a bending note. It went and and he finished, you know, as I was mixing it the other night, I was just sitting there going, he plays a riff right on the end of this swelling note that, you know, that the first time I started mixing on it, it was like I thought he took a breath there, but he didn't. He took the note all the way up and then finished the lick on it. And it's it's you when you when you see it, you'll hear it, and you'll probably sit there going, "How in the heck did he do that?" That's I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. He asked me, "Do you know what note that is?" I said, "It's a really good note." <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's it. Well, I was thinking the same way because I couldn't tell you what it was, but it yeah. was a, it was the lick. Uh, that's why we call it jazz. <laughs> well, see, but all the note was right. You know, when I was young, when we called it jazz, it's because we blew the note. <laughs> and we didn't hit the note. Go, well, that's why they call it jazz. But no, this one, this is why they call it good jazz. Because <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wondrous note, and I'm so glad that, I could, that he played it while we were recording this thing. Uh, as you'll see, uh, the big band is, uh, to me again, I was just in awe the whole time and I was, you know, hustling my butt off to try to put all this thing together in there. And you, as you'll see in the video and stuff, uh, it was just a, it's the whole, the whole day was, it was magic. You know, there were so magical moments that were just always happening to it. And especially when you're looking out at, you know, at 20 people out there, Playing this thing all well. That's that's how I ended up here. Second grade, going to the symphony orchestra down here at Fair Park. I just couldn't believe what I heard, and I knew somewhere, you know, well, it was right after that that uh, American Bandstand came out, and like we were talking earlier about how how the influences of your family and stuff can you know can lead you on a path this way, or even the absence of influences of your family and close people around here give you an open door to find those things and find that path. I had musical influences in my family, but I also grew up at a time when American Bandstand came on. I was in the third grade and I would go straight home from school carrying my trombone all the way to, you know, back and forth. And that's where I got my musical influence. And I, I never learned to read until later on. Well, I was learning to read one trombone, but that was all I ever did learn. And uh, it was listening to good, the music that made you feel good uh, is what you just kept following. And, uh, you know, was it your family, members of your family, or influences in school, or, or just, a, a, you know, Sometimes it's just a song, but but what made you go the way you went? Well, I'm not sure exactly why I picked the trumpet. Um, I wanted to play in band, and uh, my parents were not musicians, but they did, there was always music in the house. And uh, they did have a record player, and we had Frank Sinatra records, and we had a couple of Doc Severinsen records, which I thought were really neat and didn't really know why. Um, But when I got a chance to play in the band, um, I was basically given the cornet because I didn't really choose it as much as they said, here, we think you ought to play this. (laughs) And apparently they were right because I immediately took it all apart and uh, just fell in love with everything about it. And my dad said that he knew I was gonna, I was getting pretty good when our great Dane 
stop trying to crawl under the bed when I practice. <laughs> and I practiced all the time. I just was drawn to it. Um, and then, of course, I tried to sound like Doc Severinsen uh, and, and never succeeded, and I'm still trying. And <laughs> <laughs> um, passion for music um, just kind of lit inside of me. And I don't know if it maybe skipped a generation because my grandmother on my mother's side was a Colatura soprano in the St. Louis Opera Company. My parents always supported me. Um, they did generally about 10 p.m. was cut off point for practicing. But <laughs> other than that, they always supported uh, everything I did uh, musically. Even when I was in seventh grade, I realized in music, I would never learn everything there was to know about music. So I knew that I could just spend the rest of my life doing this, uh, playing the trumpet and learning about music. Um, I have uh, arranged and composed as well as played the trumpet. Um, as time goes on now, I'm going to um, arrange and, and write some for the big band as well as uh, some more compositions for uh, uh, the small group that I've been uh, working on, a uh, small combo. I was right, even in seventh grade, there's always more to learn. I guess what I'd like to know, because I've, now that I'm a, a big fan, uh, now that I have a big band out there that I can uh, really relate to, uh, you know, which is, again, just fits into here. I think about my dad every time I was listening to these guys playing out here. I'm thinking about my dad. My dad would be just sitting there doing. He'd be tapping it out and just grooving along with it. Uh, so my future thing is, uh, you know, where can we find you guys playing and what y'all's, you know, what y'all's future? You know, we, we've talked about this whole process that we're doing right now uh, is, you know, is leaning towards an album project. You know, and in, in my mind, we just started it. I hope to see it completed. Uh, right. Um, because we've got a good beginning. Yeah. Um, so I don't know exactly where it's going to go. I, we do play once a month. We've, we've got a regular uh, home at Z Grill in Flower Mound on, um, and I guess we're going to start playing the second Wednesdays of the month, uh, of every month. With more promotion, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to uh, spread ourselves out a little bit more. It is certainly a um, very talented band, and I'm hoping to uh, also use it as a workshop for composers and arrangers. If you love music, this is a this is a form of music that you just don't hear very often, and these guys and gals do it as good as I've ever heard it. We're right at the beginning of all of this, so look for us with Larry Spencer and uh, Rock Ridge Big Band. And all that media is on its way and it's coming. And uh, like I say, it's, uh, this is, has, has been a blessing for me. And it's uh, uh, a dear lady artist that I worked with for many, many years has kind of kept up with me and, and you know, calls me up about my bucket list. This was one of the main, and in this lady's mind, you only get a bucket list of 10 things. This was one of the big ones, <laughs> and I feel just wonderful about being a part of it, like everything. You know, and as Larry has expressed, uh, the love of doing this is its own fulfillment. And uh, I did an interview with Tim and everybody the first time I went to hear one of the live streams of Dallas Music Network. And all I could do was look at all these good people getting together, you know, through a foundation to help people find that part of their dream. 
you know, and, and, you know, and these were young people and then I was seeing older people like me, that's, it never stops. And that's the good side, the wonderment of all this thing in music is if you find your place in it, it is the most blessed journey. Uh, I, I can't gripe about my life at all. I just can't. I just, every time I, every time I ever get down, this is what brings me back. And uh, I'm an old geezer, and I've had all the same thing that every one of us are going to experience as you get older and with health problems and everything else. And, and as I've watched my parents, all the old people that I've watched leave this earth and leave this presence, their spirit inside was what made their life so much and so so joyous and that's what made it joy for their family and everything about you know all around them and I feel blessed and I feel blessed to know people like Larry that have found the same thing when he said a while ago that he said when I looked at, at the music and the trumpet and I could I could see so much to learn that this lifetime there isn't a much as as enough of this lifetime to learn it all and what a blessing to have that kind of a journey to go to my daughter uh, when you said that it just blew me away because my daughter went into aerospace and and the reason she went into aerospace she wanted something that she would be thinking the rest of her life yearning to find out more find out more and that was the goal. And I said, "Honey, I think you picked <laughs> you picked one that's going to go a long way." <laughs> but that's the same thing too, you know. It uh, is. It's it's the greatest journey I I've, I could ever you know think about. And for me, it just happened. Just broke an ankle going after a basketball scholarship, and ended up in the coffee house that night. <laughs> with no scholarship <laughs> but three dollars and 25 cents for three songs i ate the rest of the week and here it is 57 years later <laughs> blessings to all of you out there and uh we love that you're here with us thank you very much thanks so much for listening to the dallas music network podcast if you like what you hear be sure to subscribe we're just getting started, and we don't want you to miss a single new episode. If you really like what you hear, please be sure to rate and review. Every rating helps us to climb higher in the podcast rankings, so new listeners just like you can discover the artists we're showcasing. Dallas Music Network isn't just a podcast, though. We also host live performances, interviews, and more on our website, dallasmusicnetwork.com. That's dallasmusicnetwork.com. You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Just scroll up and click the links to catch the cool behind-the-scenes content we're posting to our social media channels daily. All Dallas Music Network shows can also be viewed in your TV through the Two Stage TV app, available for free on all major TV streaming services and in the Google Play and Apple App Stores for mobile devices. Dallas Music Network's shows, including this podcast, are brought to you in part by a generous gift from Timothy R. Wallace. We'll see you right back here really soon for more of the music you need to hear from the musicians you need to know.